Thank you very much. It's great to be back in Sofia and back at Ratio. Uh, so, I'm going to be talking to you about aliens. Is there life on Mars or anywhere else in the universe apart from on Earth? Now, I'm afraid I don't know the answer. Okay, so let's just get that out of the way first. But I do know what the answer is, in a way. What this equation means is the answer, the probability of there being alien life is either zero or one. Now, we all know that's the actual answer, or the answers, but it doesn't feel that way. Yeah? We all have some kind of, rather than thinking it as being impossible or absolutely certain, we're actually somewhere on a scale from naught, there are none, to one, yes, there must be aliens. And what I'm going to do today is to try and undermine, to make you doubt, because I expect that most of you will feel probably, yes, there must be some kind of life somewhere else. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a vote. And I'm going to try and remember the figures, or if Petco can remember them for me. I'm going to ask you two questions. First, is there life, so any kind of life? And then secondly, is there intelligent life? And you've got three choices. You're nearly certain, you're not quite sure, or you're fairly certain there are, isn't life. That's point 0.01. So, first for life elsewhere. Hands up, who is 0.9? Okay, that's virtually all of you. Hands up, who's 0.5? Not for a handful, and hands up, who's 0.1? Virtually nobody. Okay, a handful. Somebody very doubtful over there. Right, now for intelligent life elsewhere. Who's really pretty certain that there must be intelligent life elsewhere? Okay, so that's about a quarter of you. Who's n at point 0.5? That's most of you. And who's down at point 0.1? Okay, so my job here is to try and move you, especially for that second question, down towards the lower end of the scale. Right, and we'll see at the end, we'll take another vote, and we'll see whether it's worked. So, this is uh, earlier this year, this is Mars, and sadly, as far as we're aware, there are no Martians. But you can see here that there was water. Around about 3.6 billion years ago, Mars was covered with oceans and lakes, there was running water, and you can see in the picture the layered sedimentary rock shows that this was uh, an old lake bed. Now, although there is now no life on Mars, as far as we know, there may well have been at one point. And one of the strong arguments for expecting that there is life somewhere else is that space is very, very big. And just to give you an idea of how big it is, I'm going to show you a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, you can probably see there's a little uh, square down at the bottom, and that, where it says XDF, and what they did was to train the space telescope on that tiny patch. You can see how big the moon is to scale. Tiny, tiny patch of space. And just left the, spa left the telescope looking. And I'll show you what it saw. So here's in that tiny space is what it can see. And those dots aren't stars. They're galaxies. So basically, the universe is as big as you can imagine, and then some. It is absolutely huge. So the argument, therefore, is if it's so big and we're here, then kind of inevitably, there must be something somewhere else. And I guess that's the kind of thinking that most of you have. But we need to put ourselves into context. This is the, solar system, this is the, the Milky Way, our galaxy. And you can see where we are. We're on this tiny little... Part. We're not anything important, we're not at any significant part of uh, our, our galaxy, and indeed our galaxy is not in any significant part of the universe. So this is what's called the Laniakia supercluster of galaxies, and again, we're just kind of in the middle of nowhere. And you could either argue that that suggests, again, that life must be everywhere, because somewhere so apparently insignificant is full of life, or it might just be that this is the very unique place that we're here. And this is the problem. This is Enrico Fermi, who's a great physicist, uh, created the first atomic uh, reactor. And he said, well, OK, the universe is very, very big, etc. So where is everybody? 
Where are they? Why aren't there aliens coming and visiting us? Why can't we hear their radio signals? Why aren't there robot probes whizzing through the solar system? Because unless you believe in a lot of strange stories about alien abduction, there is no evidence at all for any life outside of Earth. So this is the paradox, and we still haven't really resolved it. I'll give you some answers. Obviously, fiction has got some answers. This is from fantastic film Arrival. Uh, sometimes things happen quite strangely. This is 2001, A Space Odyssey. And sometimes we actually do receive signals. Uh, this is from the marvelous film Contact with Jodie Foster. So fiction, of course, has dealt with this in a lot of ways. But I want to try and undermine, as I say, your conviction about life. And I'm going to do this by telling you about the only kind of life we know, which is the history of life on Earth. And that tells us that life is not inevitable, and above all, intelligent life, and us, even less so. There's nothing inevitable about us being here. It's a whole series of very unlikely events. Okay, but the universe is very, very big, but I think that doesn't mean there must be intelligent life. Okay? I'm, not going to, I'm going to argue that's not inevitable because of this history of chance events. In fact, there's very little about the evolution of life on Earth that was inevitable. And Frank Drake was a, a, still is, he's still alive, he's an astronomer, and he tried to work out the probability of there being uh, alien life, alien civilizations that we could communicate with. And he came up with this thing called the Drake Equation, which has got a series of values in it, which I'm not, most of which are, uh, and some of which are knowable, which are about the number of planets there are and so on. But above all, uh, he has these points at the end, which are about the probability of life and civilizations continuing. So these are the things I'm going to be going through. I'm going to be looking at the probability of life on Earth. All these are Earth values, because it's all we know. The probability of multicellularity, the probability of intelligence, civilization, and above all, a long-lived civilization, so that we might be able to communicate with others. And I'm going to show you that all these probabilities are really, really small. And when you add them to or multiply them together, you end up with a very, very unlikely possibility. And above all, of course, n equals 1. We only have one example to go from. So that's better than nothing, but it's just life on Earth. OK, what's the probability of life? Well, to start, you need to know, well, what is it? Especially if you're in NASA or somewhere and you want to try and find alien life, you need to know what you're looking for. And uh, biology is very messy, and the answer is we don't really know. So there are lots of different definitions people would use. Uh, there's about 26, I think, floating about out there. But there's no single definition of what life is. As far as we know on Earth, it appeared just once. So all life, everything that you can see about you, we can look at its DNA and we can trace it back to a single event around about 3.8 billion years ago. This is called the last universal common ancestor. So it's the common ancestor of you, of bacteria, of kangaroos, of everything. And that was a group of cells that was living deep in the ocean a long, long time ago. Now, that set of organisms would have been used DNA for its hereditary material and would have been made of proteins. But we can probably guess, and the assumption now is, that that wasn't how life began. There was something before that of which no trace, living trace, remains. And this is called the RNA world. So you've got DNA in your body, which is your genes, the, the memory of what you are like that makes you the way you are. But you've also got another molecule called RNA, which does lots and lots of things in your body. It's incredibly active. It's in all your cells right now. It's doing an amazing number of things. And it can also copy itself, like DNA can. So scientists think that the earliest form of life had, was simply RNA. It could copy itself. And because RNA is a very clever molecule, not like DNA, it can actually act on the world, change chemical reactions. 
And although amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins that you're all made of, although they can form spontaneously and we can find them on comets, we don't think that's how life began. They would have been used later on by this RNA world, which began way, way back in our history. Now, whatever happened, in trying to know where life began, we know that DNA and RNA are both very, very fragile. They can be damaged very, very easily. So the idea of where it could have happened is quite limited, because this is what Earth would have been like around about the time that life began. It's not very nice. Uh, it's being bombarded by comets, which are probably bringing water and certainly bringing destruction. The sun at the time was incredibly strong. So ultraviolet light would have destroyed any form of life that is living at the surface. We all know now about the dangers of skin cancer because ultraviolet light can damage our cells. Well, if you were a, a proto-organism, a small group of replicating molecules, you would be destroyed if you were right at the surface. So something else must have happened. Darwin thought that life evolved in a warm, muddy pond. We don't think that's the case because everything in that warm, muddy pond would have died very, very quickly. Instead, we think it was probably somewhere like this. So this is called the Lost City. It's in the middle of the Atlantic, and it's uh, a place where there are huge upsurges of lava and the development of hydrothermal vents, so hot water is coming up from underneath the ocean. And when it meets the sea, then you get what's called a proton gradient. So there's energy is available, because that's what life needs. Life needs to find an energy source. And although now all life on Earth depends on photosynthesis, ultimately, on the sun, that isn't how life began. There were other sources of energy, and it was probably in these deep vents. What's particularly interesting is that people have been investigating these places, and they now find some very, very strange bacteria. A whole new class of organisms that live in these places has been discovered. Now, these aren't our ancestors, but they show that these are very unique sources of energy that life can use. And I'm going to show you, then, what happened next. I'm going to show you in a video made by an artist called Claire Evans the history of life on Earth in one minute. Okay? And you'll see there's a stopwatch in the bottom right-hand side, and that's going to give you the time that's elapsed, and then there's the dates uh, as well. So we start off with the formation of the Earth, around four and a half billion years ago. And I just want you to look at what's happening. Listen, she describes what's happening. Okay. Formation of the Earth. Formation of the Earth. Formation of the Earth. Formation of the Earth. Formation Outgassing of molecules. Formation of oceans. rocks. Prokaryotic cell Metaphysical Metaphysical photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis by blue-green algae. It's all single cells. Eukaryotic cell organisms. Last banded ion formation. Rise of multicellular organisms. Still nothing you would recognize as an animal or anything like that. Cambrian expansion of waxy coated algae begins. So you can see that all the stuff that you're interested in is really squeezed into a very small time of life's history on Earth, the last five, six seconds. For most of history, life has just been slime. That's all we've had, and for most of that time, it's been in the sea. So life coming out onto land is around about 500 million years ago. Before that, we're talking about things living and single-celled organisms, small groups of organisms living deep in the ocean, maybe at the surface or close to the surface when they're photosynthesizing. So that immediately tells us that this is not a terribly... There's no inevitability there. Humans 
weren't inevitable from this process. It took an awful long time for things to happen. And all this amazing life we can see around us is really very, very, very recent event. Okay, so the probability of life, you could argue, is quite high because basically, as soon as the Earth was ready, life appeared. As soon as the temperatures lowered enough and the water was there, pretty much within a couple of hundred million years, life appeared. And at the same time, Mars was in a very similar state. Mars had a warm, wet atmosphere, oceans. So there's, I will accept anybody who says, well, if it happened on Earth, it could have happened uh, on Mars. Mars was also volcanically active in the seas at that time. So there may well have been the same processes. So it is possible that the same things happened on Earth as happened on Mars. And if you've got the right warmth, wet, energy-rich conditions, these molecules will just kind of spontaneously come together and start replicating. But really, when we think about alien life, we're not thinking about slime, are we? We're thinking about bug-eyed monsters that want to come and eat us or shake our hands or whatever. And to do that, you need to have lots of cells. You need to be multicellular. And this is, I think, where it gets rather surprising about how life on Earth occurred. Because you've seen from the video that the multicellular organisms turn up around about a billion years ago. So for 2.6 billion years, there's nothing complicated. So why did it take so long? Well, part of the problem or the clue to understanding is what what's important about being multicellular. And the key thing was a step called the creation of the eukaryote organism. So not all eukaryotes are multicellular, but you have to be a eukaryote to be multicellular. And what being a eukaryote does, it means you've got these things. Mitochondria. You've got billions of these working away right now, giving you energy, enabling you to function. And so too does your cat, a kangaroo, a plant, all sorts of things. Everything multicellular has got these mitochondria in them. And these mitochondria have a rather strange origin. They're not the only thing that's unique about eukaryotes. We also uh, have sex. So bacteria with, which aren't eukaryotes don't. They have a weird kind of exchange, but it's not. they don't have different sexes. They don't have a nucleus where they keep the genetic material, and they can't eat other things. Phagocytosis, going around them and invading and swallowing something. And the eukaryotes, we know, again, appear just once. So all eukaryotic life, kangaroos, you, trees, all goes back to that single event around about 2 billion years ago. So we've got the origin of life at 3.8, and then 1.8 billion years later, eukaryotic life. Why did it take so long? Well, it took so long because there was no tendency, there's no urge. Life has no desire to get to an end point. It's just a series of things that happen with natural selection operating on them. And what happened to create the uh, eukaryotic cell was that two cells of different types, they're technically called an archaebacterium and a eubacterium, met. They didn't eat each other, but one of them, the eubacterium, got swallowed up and lived on inside. And indeed, it's still living now in you. Because those you bacterium are turned into your mitochondria. So you may have heard about mitochondrial DNA. We've got two kinds of DNA inside us. We've got our nuclear DNA, which is, makes us look the way we are. But our mitochondria have a second lineage, completely different. Because ultimately, it's a different organism. You've got you are composed of two kinds of life. Not just you, but all eukaryotic life's the, cell, the same. And what this enabled the eukaryotic life eventually to do was to get bigger, be more energetically active, because we had these, well, kind of midway between parasites and things that we had captured, these mitochondria that could create energy for us. So there's nothing inevitable about the eukaryotic 
eukaryotic cell. And you mustn't think there's nothing, anything inevitable about multicellular life either, because most eukaryotes carried on being single-celled organisms. Today, most eukaryotes are single-celled organisms. Multicellular organisms, which are what we're interested in, are really quite rare and unlikely. And most of you will have seen the tree of life. We now don't teach a tree of life. It's a strange ring, because we've got the two kinds of bacteria, and then this event happened where one of them swallowed another, or they ended up cooperating and living together, and these eukaryotes are these strange hybrids, which are you. So in a way, we are the aliens. We're the odd things on Earth with this conjunction of two different kinds of life. Now, the key point about the eukaryotic cell is that it was not the product of natural selection. Okay? It was not a series of events that were selected. It just happened. In two billion years, or 1.8, a long time anyway, natural selection didn't create a eukaryote. So all those events that were happening from the creation of uh, appearance of life to the appearance of the eukaryotic cell, natural selection did not create anything there. There's no tendencies. This is what I want to convince you of. There's nothing inevitable about this. It's that chance event that happened just once on a Tuesday afternoon. Well, it must have done. I mean, okay, well, you can argue with it. It's a Wednesday. But, it, you know, this is a single event. It may have happened again, but if it did happen again, either those lineages died out or we ate it. And given that the number of organisms that we've sequenced, we have the DNA of, I'm increasingly convinced that it did indeed happen just once. There's nothing lingering in the oceans uh, of any other event. Once this chance event has occurred, then natural selection operates. Okay, so I'm, I'm being extremely Darwinian here, don't worry. So the chance event happens and then natural selection can find different ways uh, of doing things. So to understand how likely it is that there might be big bug-eyed monsters wanting to come and eat us, you need to think, well, how likely is it that we're here? Now, it looks inevitable because we are here. But that's just a, a trick of the light. It's an illusion. The probability that that event happened, and as I said, it just happened once as far as we know. Just imagine how many single-celled organisms are there in the oceans. I have no idea. There's more, probably more than there are stars in the visible universe. And they've been there for 3.8 billion years. And how often have they bumped into each other? And how often did that produce the eukaryotic cell? Just once. So you can see that the probability of the eukaryotic cell is incredibly small. So here's our kind of time scale, rough time scale. The universe began 14 billion years ago. Earth was created about 4.3. Life appeared about 3.8. The eukaryotes around about 2 billion years. And then after, again, a long, long period of time, multicellular life appears. And even then, the appearance of all the amazing things, as you could see from the video, happens in the last 500 million years, more or less, since what's called the Cambrian explosion. So these events and the huge timescales between them really tells us there's nothing inevitable about this. It didn't have to happen that way. Okay, so what's the probability of intelligence? Because again, this looks kind of obvious. We're very smart and we're here and therefore we must be the end point of evolution. Again, no, there's nothing inevitable about the evolution of intelligence. And indeed, biologists are very clear that there's no overall tendency for increased complexity. We can't see any kind of linear increase over time with organisms getting more and more complex. So we need to fit that statement with our very clear impression that we are really precious and important, which we are, and that we're, in a way, the kind of summit. So how do we put that together? Well, here's a traditional tree of life. And at the very top is man, not woman, man at the very top. 
and all the various different kinds of uh, animal below. So that's how it used to be seen in the 19th century. And this is how it's seen today. These are all the eukaryotes. And this is, we don't present it as a tree anymore because there's no inevitable end point. Uh, and you can see that animals are on the top left, plants are on the top right, fungi bottom left. And where are we? You couldn't look at this and say, ah, oh, yes, this is the end point. This is obviously why evolution has happened. And just like we're kind of nowhere in the solar system and in the galaxy and in the universe, we're not really anywhere on that tree. So we now have pushed back the date for the first anatomically modern humans to around about 300,000 years ago. So we appeared really very, very late in that story of life we've just seen. And there was nothing inevitable about it. We were very, very lucky. Because the history of life has been punctuated by a series of mass extinctions. This is the most famous one. Uh, this is a picture taken from a satellite 66 million years ago. <laughs> See, the aliens are here. Um, and this is, of course, the terrible catastrophe for most of life, but our opportunity, which led to the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. So the birds, or well, some of the birds survived, uh, the rest of the dinosaurs, and an awful lot of other stuff went extinct. Our ancestors survived. They'd been around for a long time. But the extinction of the nine avian dinosaurs, because of the asteroid that hit the Earth, changed everything and allowed, eventually, birds to spread all over the planet, and, obviously, mammals, and eventually, us. So I said, this is just one of the events. It's not the worst one, by any means. So, 250 million years ago, there was another mass extinction at the end of what's called the Permian. 95% of all sea life goes extinct. 99% of all plankton. This is an unbelievable catastrophe. All the trilobites, the placoderms, which are these big armored fish, they all disappear in not quite so quickly as uh, the, what happened in the months after the asteroid hit, but it's still, a, geologically speaking, it's virtually instantaneous. 70% of all land animals are made extinct by this. We're not sure why, but massive, incredibly rapid climate change, perhaps due to a series of volcanic explosions. There's no evidence that there was a, a meteorite that hit. And our ancestors, which were called the therapsids, they got through, just. As did the ancestors of the dinosaurs, obviously, because they survived. But we only just made it. And it wouldn't be an enormous surprise if something had gone slightly different. Of course, we wouldn't be here to talk about this, but things can happen. Things could have been very, very different. So our history of life on Earth has been these series of unfortunate events that some species have got through. But there's nothing inevitable, there's nothing written into our DNA that meant that we would survive anything. Our ancestors were just lucky. What how would have happened if we hadn't turned up? Would something smart have eventually uh, appeared? Well, maybe. So this is a tool-making dinosaur. Uh, this is a Caledonian crow, and they are very, very smart. They can make tools, and they can even make tools to make tools. So they've got quite a pretty intelligent bird brain on them. But as far as we know, they may have been doing this for around about 20 million years. Where's your iPhone? They never did anything. They can make tools, and then what? Nothing. They're very, very smart, but you know, they're nothing like our lineage. By like our, the primates. So this might lead us to think, well, yes, of course, we're really special, and this was inevitable, even though it's really getting a long time of us not being around, and intelligence of any real sort not being around, and then suddenly in this last period, it is there. So we've got life appearing 3.8 billion years ago, and then what you may think is the end point of that process, right at the very end, 300,000 years ago, in the last second of life on Earth. That, that doesn't really look like anything inevitable. It's just the way it is. 
And even then, we were incredibly lucky yet again. So we can sequence the DNA from people all over the world, and using some fancy population genetics equations, we can work out how big the human population must have been at various points. And just before some of our ancestors began to move out of Africa, around about 70,000 years ago, the human population was just 12,000 people, scattered across North, Central, and East Africa. 12,000. Very small town, large village. Wouldn't have taken much for famine, drought, disease, to have eliminated us completely. So we are really very, very lucky. Okay, what about the probability of a detectable civilization? Either one that we can detect or one that could send us a probe or a message or whatever. So, civilization, hard to say. First settlements, the beginning of what's called the Agrarian Revolution, which took about 2,000 years, so it was a very long-winded revolution. This is one of the earliest settlements uh, in Anatolia, and it's about 9,000 years ago. So 9,000 years ago, if you were in your spaceship coming around your flying saucer, you might have noticed this little patch of buildings, but you wouldn't have been able to tell that there was anything going on, and indeed, they couldn't communicate to you. So the universe is 14 billion years ago, civilization only 9,000. Marconi, we began our radio transmissions uh, at the end of the last century, and eventually Marconi was able to bounce transmissions off uh, the inner part of the atmosphere and to extend his transmission to uh, thousands of kilometers. That was at the beginning of the 20th century. So our messages have been traveling out for about 120 years. So maybe the answer as to where are the aliens is they don't know we're here. Here's the, solar, here's the, the Milky Way, seen from above. Again, an alien sent us this. And the, you probably can't make out, but if you look at the square, you can see there's a little blue dot. And that is a 120 light year diameter. So that's as far as our incredibly, initially, very, very feeble radio transmitters would have extended. So if you had a, a radio telescope a bit like one of ours, and it was the size of a planet, you might just be able to pick up, if you're on the edge of that 120 light year sphere, you might just be able to pick up a message. So it's possible that this whole galaxy is full of people and things, bug-eyed monsters chatting to each other or eating each other or whatever your particular fear is, and they just haven't looked around here because it's kind of nowhere. Why would you want to go to that neighborhood? It's a bit crappy. There's nothing much. There's no shops. Can't get coffee there, and you wouldn't know we were here. So that is possible. But then both for us to be able to contact aliens and for aliens to contact us, and this was a key part of the Drake equation, which he wrote in the 1960s, is that civilization has got to hang around for a while. You want it to carry on transmitting its messages or sending its probes. And, of course, this is where it gets a bit serious when we think about us. So here are just four. I could have chosen others. Here are just four of the existential threats we would be or should be worried about. Climate change, viruses that are going to kill us. This is the Ebola virus, the overpopulation. And, of course, let's not forget that good old favorite nuclear war, which was partly what Frank Drake uh, was worried about. So we've got to carry on long enough if we want to convince other people that we're here and either say, come and meet us or come and eat us, if you're like Stephen Hawking, who doesn't think we should be saying anything because he's convinced aliens will want to eat us. I, I don't think they'll want to eat us. There's plenty of good stuff to eat in the universe without us. You don't just eat life. There's plenty of carbon floating about. So these are real problems for getting a message out there, or even us hanging around for long enough to be able to receive any message that's beamed in our direction. 
So I think that if you multiply all those probabilities that I've explained, you get to a very, very, very small number. So the probability of life on Earth, which looks kind of inevitable, the probability of intelligent life on Earth, of you being here listening to me, is just so astonishingly unlikely. Now, I don't think that means that there's any external force that has made it happen. I just mean, think it means it's very, very unlikely. But, of course, the universe is a very, very big place. I give you that. So there's a lot of stars out there. So it is not impossible, that's for sure, that somewhere on another planet something similar has happened and there are forms of life that have been as, gone through as unlikely a series of events as ours has. And if that is the case, then what can we say? Well, a lot of people called xenobiologists think about this quite hard. They haven't got any evidence to go on at the moment, which is kind of frustrating, but they think about what alien life might look like. And this is one of the kind of more fantastic uh, hypotheses they have that is, in fact, it's already here. There is weird life already. Uh, there is life that doesn't use nucleic acids. There are other replicating molecules, and we can't detect them, which is absolutely true. If you were to try and find some strange form of life using... PCR, one of the ways that we use to amplify DNA, if it hasn't got any DNA in it, you're not going to get anything back. So this is this strange stuff here. This is one of the, the targets for the xenobiologists or the people who think there is weird life. Uh, and this is called desert varnish. And it appears on rocks uh, in the uh, Arizona desert. Strange things always happen in Arizona. Uh, I'm not sure why. And some people think that this, these dark streaks, which don't appear to be organic, and they have no known geochemical origin, that they may be some odd form of life that we can't detect. They come and they go and so on. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence for that, and uh, my view is that it's just a bit of geology we don't understand yet. But it could be possible that these are non-DNA uh, organisms that are living here in what's called a shadow biosphere, just next door to us. We can't detect it. A bit like if this room was full of uh, creatures made out of dark matter and using dark energy. We wouldn't even know. So whilst that's quite fun, especially when you're quite young, if you've been smoking something and you're sitting out looking at the stars, uh, as a scientist, I don't find it a terribly useful hypothesis because I can't, I can't do anything with it, apart from design experiments which are kind of doomed to fail. But we can say something about, uh, important about aliens. For the processes of life, whatever they are and however we define it, to take place, life would need water or some functionally equivalent solvent that you can put chemicals in, put molecules in, and they won't get destroyed. Uh, water is an astonishing stuff, and there's an awful lot of it in the universe. So there's a good reasons for thinking that you look for the water. This is one of the things that NASA does. It looks for the water and then thinks, well, maybe that's where life is. And indeed, one of the odd frustrations about Mars is we know there is still water on Mars. It's incredibly salty. No Earth organism could survive in it. But there's still water on Mars. But there is something called the Interplanetary Protection Organization which is not made of aliens, it's made of humans. And their job is to preserve interplanet other, other planets. So NASA has agreed, has signed up, all of the major space organizations have signed up to a protocol which says, if there's water, you don't go there. Because your spaceship, no matter how much you clean it, and despite the fact that it's been in interplanetary space, will have bacteria on it. And your spaceship that lands there could then corrupt or eat the water source, it, other forms of life that might be there. So it's quite tricky. But anyway, there's plenty of water. Here's one of those riverbeds on Mars from 3.5 billion years ago. Other options are available. This is Enceladus, an ice moon close to Saturn. And although it's ice on the outside, on the inside there's an ocean. Now this is a very, very small uh, moon. It's not very big at all, but the, the, moon, the gravity of Saturn is keeping it warm by pulling it and stretching it. And you may have seen these videos, this picture. We had no idea about this. The surface of Enceladus has got fissures in it. They're cracks that are pulled open by 
the gravitational pull of Saturn. And there are these fountains that spurt hundreds of kilometers into the air. And these fountains are made of water. And although our spaceships have flown through there and detected organics, we didn't have devices, because nobody was expecting this, there are no devices on there that could detect life. And that's one of the options that NASA is looking at to go and investigate the fountains of Enceladus. This is another option. Europa, moon of Jupiter, and they've had projects which sadly NASA has decided not to fund to land uh, a lander on there which would then bore a hole and send a submarine down into the ocean to see what was there. Sadly, that didn't get funded. What we can say is that alien biology will have to obey the laws of physics. So if in those oceans there are large meter-scale predators, we know they will look like this. And we know that from the history of life on Earth. So these are four lineages, completely separate. Dolphins, ichthyosaur, shark, and an octopus. And they've all got the same streamlined shape. Because if you want to move fast in liquid, this is the way to do it. Natural selection makes you this way. This is the most efficient way to move. So if there are large, as I say, decent-sized predators on the oceans of Enceladus Europa, I guarantee they will look like this because natural selection will operate wherever. That's one of the givens of life. But if they're very small, they can look like anything. Because when the laws of physics operate in a different way, water becomes different at small scales. These are plankton, and you can be any old shape you want. So if they're microscopic animals or things like that, they could be anything. This is generally what we tend to think they look like. And, you know, although the strange octopoids from uh, Arrival aren't bad, they're all actually just kind of variants of what's going on on Earth, including the alien, which is based on various insects. The British biologist J.B.S. Hal Haldane had a phrase which I think is actually right, that in fact the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. It's going to, whatever we find, leaving aside those things like overall shape, it's going to be very bizarre. And we again know this from the history of life on Earth. Here are four absolutely unique lineages. No other animal looks like the duck-billed platypus and ever has done. Elephants and their relatives are the only organisms that have trunks. No other organism but a kangaroo has bounded, as far as we know from the fossil record. And stegosaurs with their weird plates are just too bizarre. So life on Earth has thrown up some pretty odd-looking things. You add that to all the various other things that may have been happening on other planets. Who knows what they might look like? OK, so we're back to voting. Right, our three choices. So life. Who, th who thinks, hands up if you think that life is pretty much inevitable? 0.9. OK, well, it's actually gone down. Wow. Uh, 0.5. OK. Point one, okay, I think I've done my job there. I moved you down, right? See the really key one, the intelligent life. Who is up there at point nine, thinks it's pretty much inevitable? Oh, victory, victory is sweet. <laughs> point five, okay, point one. Okay, I've got a lot more of you with me this time. Right, and that's really it. That's, that's my job done. I can't do anything else but make you doubt and think and know a bit more about the history of the only life we know on know about, which is life on Earth. If you want to know more, then uh, there's this great book called Aliens, which is on sale in the, book sh in the, uh, in the fantastic bookstore. And that's got lots of chapters, including one by me, which I basically give you my talk. Uh, there's a book of mine about how scientists crack the genetic code. And if you're into podcasts, uh, then Adam Rutherford and Hannah Fry had a fantastic podcast about aliens with all the greats who work on uh, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and for uh, and xenobiologists. And it's a half hour, really interesting argument and debate. And you can find that on the BBC website or from your favorite podcast supplier. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.